Hello, my name is Susan Hannell. I'm an associate professor in the Textiles, Fashion, Merchandising, and Design program here at the University of Rhode Island. I teach in the technical areas of fashion design and I do research in fashion history. I am a heavy set, middle aged white woman with chin length, light brown, wavy hair, brown eyes, and brown cat eye glasses. I'm wearing a pink sweater and pink drop pearl earrings. Today I am introducing Honors Colloquium speaker Stephanie Thomas. Stephanie Thomas is a disability styling specialist and advocate who puts together fashion looks which are accessible, smart, and fashionable. She is a creative class honoree in the Business of Fashion organization where she is the only disability fashion stylist on the Business of Fashion 500 list. Stephanie is a graduate of the Academy of Art University in San Francisco and holds graduate degrees in both communication and fashion journalism. Stephanie gave a 2016 talk, TED Talk, called Fashion Styling for People with Disabilities. She lectures in fashion marketing and advocacy communication at Woodbury University in Burbank, California. She also sits on the board of the Zappos Adaptive Advisory Board and the Board of Directors for No Limits Media. Thankfully for those of us in academia, she has written a new textbook called Fitting In, The Social Implications of Fashion and Dressing with Disabilities, coming out in January 2020. Welcome to URI, Stephanie. Hi, I'm Stephanie Thomas, and thank you so much for inviting me to be part of the University of Rhode Island's Honors Colloquium Speaker Series. I'm excited to be here, and without further ado, I'm going to give you a bit of audio description to go ahead and get started today and discuss dressing with disabilities. I am a black woman. I have shoulder length hair, dark brown, cut in layers. I have wide eyes, a rounded nose, full lips, and skin that is dark coffee colored. I'm wearing gold accessories. I have what I would refer to as a zebra toned or a zebra print wrap blouse. So you can see a gold necklace and gold hoops. I am in a space where to my right, there is a gray vase and there are white flowers in the vase cut short, rounding the top of the vase. There's a bookcase behind me, a fan near the bookcase, three prongs, white center where the light would be. Also, there is cabinetry, dark wood cabinetry to my left. And there is a refrigerator to my left as well that you can see it's stainless steel. So without further ado, thank you for having me. And let's talk about dressing with disabilities. Not only is this work that I have done in one way or another, for 28 years. It is my lived experience. I am a congenital amputee, born missing digits on my right hand and feet. And that has informed so much about the work that I'm doing. But as you will learn later, it's not the thing that introduced me to dressing with disabilities. I am the founder of Curatable a boutique social enterprise that is committed to eradicating negative perceptions of people with disabilities by simply using styling as a tool. And I'll share a bit of information with you a little bit later to let you know why that is the tool that I chose to use. But I want to begin by laying out for you the five areas that I'm gonna focus on today. First, what is dressing with disabilities, right? What's the difference in dressing with and without disabilities? Second, what are some of the common myths about dressing with disabilities or even being a person with a disability? Next, functional fashion movement. And I will introduce you to my styling method, which includes 
my disability fashion styling system. And finally, a real discussion about one of the greatest barriers to more clothing options for people with disabilities, the fashion industry's disability problem. James Baldwin, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Disability, 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 disability. This is where I have to start today because however you felt when you saw that word flash onto the screen, that's the filter through which you will hear everything that I say today. There's no way around it. You will not hear me use terms such as all abilities, special needs, differently abled. If that is a way that you describe yourself personally, everyone gets to self-identify. But as a person with a disability and as a trained disability advocate, the way that I view this word, D-I-S-A-B-I-L-I-T-Y, disability, I view it through the social model of disability. I don't see the barrier within our community. I see the barrier outside of the community. And I just want you to think about this. Like when you look at this word, does it make you cringe that I keep saying it, that I spelled it, that I said it in different ways? If you tend to be more scholarly, you may think, oh, that's dramatic. But I really want you to think about it. In what class did you learn about this word? In what class in school? And I don't mean a special you know, program that people did in order to have diversity or inclusion. I mean, when did you learn about disability in science, in math? And I don't mean the way we have the idea of the super crip. And what that basically means is, oh, this one in a million person that uses their disability and they are someone that is so spectacular. I don't mean that. I mean, when do we teach disability history? When is it normalized? The word ableism may be a word that you've heard before. I don't throw it around lightly because here's the way that I see it. The way that we approach disability, and I'm, this is coming from me, a person with a disability. The way that we approach disability has a lot to do with how we view it in our society. Have you ever heard of the ugly laws? There is a movie, a film, The Music Within, and I was blown away when I first learned about this film. I was going through my disability advocacy training with Virginia People's, the, the department for the department for people with disabilities uh, that did a lot of the training in the state of Virginia. But I was blown away to know that there had been a beggar's law on the book since the 1800s, not just here in the States, in different parts of the world. People didn't want, this is just a loose paraphrase, but people didn't want people that were missing limbs or digits or looked pitiful to be handicapped and basically grifting people or taking money from people because they felt sorry for them. You know, that was, that was the mentality that some people expressed or the ideas that some people expressed. But, but what it really was, was a law that was on the book that allowed people to discriminate. And that law eventually became something that was used against people with disabilities. And in the film, The Music Within, there were these two friends, both had two different types of disabilities. One was verbal in the way that I'm verbal and the other person with a disability was not verbal in the same way. 
but he absolutely had a way that he communicated and his friend totally understood him. However, when he spoke in the way that he spoke, there would be drool and he would animate his body in order to communicate, which is absolutely fine because that's the way that he communicates. Well, throughout the film, this is pre, you know, it predates the Americans with Disabilities Act. They get arrested because someone in the restaurant decides that they're unsightly. And so they get arrested. And so they go around and continue to get arrested in order to help wipe this law off the books. I really suggest that you check it out because it was so educational for me and it opened me up to what I had been seeing as a greater problem. But early on in my journey, I hadn't even identified it. So this is where we have to start. And like I said, however you feel about this word, however you feel about disability, that is going to be the filter through which you hear everything I say today. Dressing with disabilities. So I want to begin with Sydney Katz. Dr. Katz developed the index of independence of activities of daily living, something that I became familiar with when researching occupational therapy. I'd met occupational therapists early on in my journey learning about dressing with disabilities. And they would talk about activities of daily living in a way that really informed how I began to develop my thoughts about dressing with disabilities. Because sometimes I talk to people and we'll get into this when we talk about the myths in a bit more detail, but there's this idea that dressing is not important or it's frivolous or just all of these ideas that I think when you take a look at basic activities of daily living, dressing and grooming as in selecting clothes, putting them on and adequately managing one's personal appearance, right? So it's the whole process of getting dressed. Then you look at how this field has grown because that's the beauty of what Dr. Katz developed. It has, you know, you know what happens to it. It starts with the basic activities of daily living, how to measure it, how to determine, okay, maybe we need to take another direction. And it's been used in so many different disciplines. But in occupational therapy, it has expanded to instrumental activities of daily living, which for the work that I do includes shopping for clothing or other items required for daily life, for daily life. And I just think that's so important. And, and what I'm noticing is this time that we've had in our homes during the pandemic, the idea of, I would say how Robin Gavon, Pulitzer Prize winning fashion critic, Robin Gavon, she writes about how our work clothes are our kind of like our uniforms, our armor. And I remember her article that came out in March, I think it was like right around March 16th, when we first here in LA, we first received our kind of lockdown orders, safer at home orders. And it, her article really spoke to me because it was talking about the idea of what happens when we basically are in pajamas all the time. And, and that really hits this idea of basic activities of daily living, instrumental activities of daily living, how what we wear impacts how we feel, the psychology of dressing. But here's why I really love Dr. Katz's work. Barry Gerland and Matthew Marr wrote this really wonderful article and this quote, I just, sometimes I just open my notes and I have to look at it because one of the things I'm reminded of when I read this is how important this is. All humans, number one important thing, people with disabilities are often ostracized from the idea of being all human, but it says all humans rely on being able to perform 
six functions for their basic independent survival. Independent survival. Transferring from reclining to standing, feeding, dressing, bathing, using the toilet, and being continent. Now, this is very different than someone seeing dressing with disabilities as, being, as kind of being this frivolous thing. Oh, it's just fashion. It's just, you know, it's not important. So I really want to bring this home. All humans rely on being able to perform six functions for their basic independent survival. This is not frivolous. Dressing with disabilities is not just important as a function, but it's important for survival and independence. Now, as a stylist, which is how I approach this entire topic, I want to talk to you today about some of the ways in which design principles enhance dressing with disabilities. I think that's important to know. Human-centered design approaches it where there's observation, understanding, and interaction. And I think the thing that I really like about the idea of human-centered design is that it takes place with people with disabilities. That's up front. It's like, we need you in order to get this right. And that is the absolute truth. There are specific, you know, like content experts that you may need to talk to, or because of someone's lived experience, they've become a content expert. But having the human that you're designing for as a part of that is something that I am a real fan of. And it really mirrors a lot of my approach to my work as a disability fashion stylist. Interestingly enough, it's something that's used in tech. You know, the gentlemen, uh, some of the people that I've, I've learned from about this, they're in technology. They do not design for people with disabilities. This is not where I learned about this. Universal design, I actually learned about universal design, University of North Carolina, universal design, architecture, but now the principles are being used more, re more frequently, I would say. The, the principles are being used in dressing with disabilities. So this is anticipating different spectrums of users from many, from many different demographics, obviously spectrum. So the thing that I like about this is that universal design says, we're not trying to do a one size fits all, but what we are trying to do is say, we see you and we're going to start with design principles for you at the beginning of the process. We're not gonna wait until we get to the end and adapt, which brings me to the next one, adaptive design. Modifying the clothing to accommodate assistive technology or other disability related issues. Now, it's not that I'm, it's my least favorite, it's just for me, I'm more of a fan of human-centered design and universal design because I want adaptive design to begin, to be at the beginning of the process, not an afterthought. So, I just thought I'd pause because it's a little noisy. So one of the things to keep in mind with COVID-19 because I've been reading a lot of articles and a lot of articles talk about, you know, basically like what's happening to the fashion industry. But I haven't been reading a lot of articles that have really been talking about how what's happening in the fashion industry is a, like really having an impact on dressing with disabilities, design for disabilities. I mean, 2019 was an amazing year for this whole idea, this whole concept, this whole conversation of dressing with disabilities. But I think from what I've seen, from the conversations I've been having with 
people in the fashion industries, the more boutique brands, and conversations I've been having with people with disabilities, I'm noticing that human-centered design, universal design, and adaptive design are all kind of, I think we're leapfrogging the time frame where it would have been more just adaptive design. And I really think we're starting to bring those ideas together and mesh those ideas together of having the person with the disability involved in the process like human-centered design and observing, understanding the people you're working for, really valuing that interaction, and then having design for disability at the beginning of the process as opposed to the end, and then adapting. There are going to be things that you do need to adapt. Let me give you an example right now. If you're able to stand independently, can you do me a favor and just stand up for me really right now? All right, please have a seat. So what did you alter? Did you pull your shirt down? Did you pull your pants up? Did you shift anything in any way? If you did, you just learned the difference between clothing for standing, clothing for sitting. Now there are some amazing arguments out there that you should be able to do both comfortably, right? But for the most part, clothing is designed for standing. Hence the idea of the human hangers going down the runway, it's not designed for sitting. But I pull clothes all the time for my seated body clients that I'm styling for different events here in LA. So it absolutely is possible. But a lot of times, I'll give you an example. If you sat down and you adjust it, maybe the way that the pants are cut or whatever you're wearing is cut, maybe the crotch area is cut a little too short. And so it makes it uncomfortable just for sitting because it was designed, like I said, for standing. Maybe it's too short. So you had to pull it down because it was designed for the length for someone who's standing most of the time instead of sitting, which is really ironic. Um, a good friend of mine, Lucy Jones, actually had a really great point when I read an article when she, that she was interviewed in and she said, we sit most of the time. Most of us do sit most of the time, unless we have a job that demands that we're on our feet, we go into the office pre-COVID or if you're still going into the office or our home offices now, and we sit down. Or if we're you know, adjusting our desk now, we sit and we stand. But for the most part, people wear clothes and sit a lot. So why should the clothes not accommodate a seated body type? The difference is, is if you are a person, and when I get into body types a little later, this will make a lot more sense. But if you are a person that has a spinal cord injury, or maybe you have spinal bifida, cerebral palsy, Anything that would cause paralysis, you know, just paralysis on a side of your body due to a stroke, any of that, that's going to impact the way that your clothing sits on your body. If you lose the muscle shape in your thighs, it's going to impact how your clothes sit on your body. So it's necessary for a seated body type to be just a bit higher in the back. It's necessary for someone who is you know, seated to maybe have the pockets a little lower. Izzy Camilleri, I call her one of the old G's. Izzy Camilleri actually was on the scene 2009 when I saw her collection come out. Premier Canadian designer puts out this collection for people with disabilities. I just could not believe it. I actually called her on the phone and had a long conversation with her. I was so happy to see that someone in her position with her prestige was doing this work. And even more exciting, just recently, Izzy put out a new pant for sitting, backless seam. So the denim looks like denim, but in the back, there are no seams, there are no rivets, it's just smooth. And it is so comfortable. I've had people tell me for sitting and there is no way that they're going to have any problems with created, you know, body sores that may come from thick seams on jeans 
or the, the rivets that we don't pay attention to because if we're ambulating independently uh, using our feet and walking, then if we sit, we're not sitting all the time. So we may not have it pressed into our bodies the same way. And the interesting thing is that when you have paralysis, you may not know if that's what's happening anyway. So that's why it's so dangerous to have that. So I'm gonna do a quick review so we can stay on track here. So when you're defining disability, dressing with disabilities is not a frivolous thing. It is something that is a basic human need for independent survival. And that independent survival could be with as much independence as possible if you're working with a dresser, a therapist, another family member that you need help every now and then. That term can be defined loosely. The way that I approach the idea of dressing with disabilities is through Dr. Katz's work and then looking at human-centered design, universal design, and adaptive design. And as a stylist, that's important to me because I need to understand garment construction. I need to understand what will and will, what will not work for my client. I need to make sure that I'm not putting something on my client that's going to be dangerous from, for them. So that's my kind of my context for dressing with disabilities. This disability drives innovation. I was listening to a TED talk and Michael Nesmith, he, he signed this. He was doing his TED talk with ASL and he signed disability drives innovation. And that really spoke to me because I've heard this, you know, different people say it in different ways, but it's true. You know, how many times now do you watch a video without listening to it? Because now they're captions. The captions are there in order for the video to be inclusive for people who are deaf. And so just having the idea of disability first or design with disability in mind from the beginning really, really does drive that innovation. Here's some of the common myths that I've heard over the years. The first one, people with disabilities don't care about fashion. That's not true. People with disabilities care about fashion. It's just that from many of the people that I've talked to and my own personal experience, we don't wanna wear clothing that we feel ostracizes us from the rest of our friends and family. So meaning that if everyone else goes shopping, even if it's an online shopping thing, we wanna have that familiarity. We wanna be able to have that shared experience. We wanna be able to post about it. So it's not true that people with disabilities don't care about fashion. Now, we're not a monolith. So one person's love for fashion is going to be very different you know, from someone else's, but that's for people without disabilities as well. Designing for people with disabilities is charity. There is no profit. Also wrong. Yes, it is great for the social return on investment to design for people with disabilities, no doubt. But at the same time, it's also really great for your return on investment because Vogue Business in a recent article stated that it's a $6 billion industry estimated, but that by 2023, it will be a thriving $6 billion industry. That is not charity. Number three, it's too complicated to design for people with disabilities. It's just too many disabilities. Another falsehood. Remember design with disability in mind from the beginning? All of this impacts dressing with disabilities. So when you have that concept of designing with disability in mind from the beginning, it really speaks to the idea of how to decide on how to help make it easy for someone 
to put on their clothes and take off their clothes, to make sure their clothes fit a certain way. You, you don't just look at the person, you then begin to look at design innovation. And here's one. The fashion industry isn't ready for such a drastic change. Well, that is also not true. And that brings me to this, functional fashion. Actually, the fun functional fashion movement was spearheaded by Helen Cookman, not alone. There were a lot of people that were doing research that brought her into this space. And I have something really special to share with you today, but I'm just going to tell you, this was 1961. It's about to be 2021. If functional fashion was going on in 1961 when this book was published, that meant it had to be going on before this, like mid 1950s. And honestly, I am really honored to be working with a co-author on an upcoming book about the history of dressing with disabilities. And my co-author has found, Kate has found just some incredible, incredible things from the 1800s, late 1700s. So the concept and the idea of design for disability isn't new. Let's take a little bit more of a deep dive here. I wanna get out of this really quick. I wanna show you something else. And I'm gonna go back to sharing the screen here. This is an actual book that was published, the one that I just showed you the pictures from, but I wanna show you this book, 1961. We're talking about dressing with disabilities in 2020, December, 2020. This book was by Helen Cookman and Muriel Zimmerman. This was a book that they just put together to help people dressing with various disabilities. I really thought this was important to see because one of the things that I tell people when they invite me in to consult is that this is not just a design issue. It's not just a design issue. The exploration of design innovation has been happening Now with COVID-19, with the pandemic, kind of the amalgamation, if you will, of human-centered design, universal design and adaptive design all coming together. Why, if this was happening here, and I guarantee if it was happening here, it was happening in different parts of the world. Why, if all of this was happening, and this is a Google book, you can Google it, you can read it and take a look at it. I just thought it was important to at least share some of it with you, to show you. Dressing with disabilities is not inhibited because no one has thought of how to design for it, or we've just been waiting for the beautiful work that Izzy Camilleri is doing, Tommy is doing, AG Apparel was doing back in the day when I first I saw uh, Jordan's work in OWN Magazine. This is not just a design issue. I wanna share my screen again really quick guys, get back to this for you. One quick second. Okay, there we go. So, we've dealt with the myths. We've looked at functional fashion. We've started to look at it. I wanna tell you a little bit more about it. So, like I said, this book was published in 1961. Natalie Wright did a really beautiful exhibition um, at the Kansas Museum. But before I even knew about Natalie Wright's work, I also had been reading about Helen Cookman 
and dissertations. I've been reading about Helen Cookman and the, uh, there are some books out in the late 1970s. And one of the things that I learned, the one problem that they had in common with the industry or lack thereof right now, the, the, the lack of growth and adoption of adaptive fashion or back then functional fashion, with all of the beautiful designers, Natalie Wright highlighted in her exhibition that there were 30 mainstream designers in the United States that signed on to the functional fashion movement. And these designers designed beautiful clothing that could be worn by anyone, but they designed based on Helen Cookman's designs. Now, Helen Cookman, another premier designer, was actually also friends with Virginia Pope, who at one time had been the fashion editor for the New York Times. Virginia Pope was celebrated for really shining a spotlight on American designers. So I could see where that interest and that collaboration would come into place, which it actually did in uh, Miss Pope's life. But one of the things that I noticed is that there was this thread of beautiful clothing, major designers getting behind it, and then it fizzles out. Beautiful clothing, major designers get interested, they start to you know, say they're gonna do this work, but then it fizzles out. The common thread, perceptions of people with disabilities. The Americans with Disabilities Act was signed July 26, 1990, which means this year we celebrated the 30th anniversary of the ADA. 30 years. And we are still new to market. When people are designing, if someone asks me, you know, if you think in terms of the marketing curve, we're still, we're still at the beginning. We're still new to market because we have not dealt with perceptions of disability which is why I said we cannot have this conversation today without thinking and talking through and, and really examining the idea of disability. My journey started in 1992 with this. I told you that I'm a congenital amputee, but I never told you how I started with this journey and started on this journey. This picture is important because I was participating in scholarship pageants in college. My pageant coach actually asked me why I never buttoned the left cuff on my shirts. She was right, I didn't, but I never paid attention to it until she asked me. I looked at my cuff and I was like, oh, I don't button it because I don't have a right thumb. The buttons are small, it would always take too long. So I just got in the habit of not buttoning it. That's when I discovered that even though I knew her husband had been a wheelchair user, he had a seated body type and she was his primary caregiver, I never understood what it was like for her to source clothing, to help him transfer, to assist him with basic activities of daily living. And she said, have you ever thought about researching clothing for people with disabilities? And so this is how it started for me. I know it seems like there's a lot of backstory to really getting into the heart of the nuts and bolts, but part of the reason that we've had the interest in the fizzle is because people just try to jump into the nuts and bolts when really dressing with disability just has a PR problem. Many people with disabilities don't understand the concept beyond the hacks that they do themselves some people don't even know adaptive clothing exists. They may have heard of Tommy Hilfiger and Zappel's Adaptive, but they may not have, and some may not have. I've worked with Zappel's Adaptive on their photo shoots, and you'll see some of the images. The images that I'm gonna share are images that I've styled. For the most part, I'll identify the ones that I haven't, but for the most part, people don't know that this is an option, that this exists. So there's really a PR problem. And that's the exact reason why the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, can turn 30 this year 
and we're still talking about being at the beginning of the market. So let's get into it. Since the industry is not caught up yet, it's going to happen. I've been saying this for 28 years. It is going to happen. But since the industry hasn't quite caught up, this is how I decided to address the issue. Over time, the work, my best practices have become the Stephanie Thomas styling method. Now, what I'm very vocal about online, in presentations, talking to people on the street, talking to their caregivers, I'm like, look, I have a disability fashion styling system. Can you remember these three words for me? Accessible, smart, fashionable. And this one guy was like, well, you trademarked it. Can I use it? I said, well, yeah, of course you can use it. Just cite me. It's not, it's not that I don't want people to use it. I absolutely do. It's just that I don't want someone saying that I've said something and then someone gets hurt or harmed and then I'm liable. So I wanna be very specific about how I share it and the knowledge that I share with people to accompany some of the, the information behind it. So I just, I want people to be safe. So as you heard, accessible is the first point. Easy to put on and take off. If you get a garment, and this goes for me too, and some days I struggle with this, especially with my footwear. But if you find something and it's not easy to put on and take off, you can't get it. It's, it's like, you've got to just be disciplined and say, look, if it's going to be difficult to put on and take off, it's not going to work. Second, is it smart? Smart for your health, medically safe. And I want to back up a bit too accessible. This doesn't mean that if you dress with a dresser that, you know, it shouldn't be easy to put on. I have seen people treat it like rag dolls when they're putting on jackets and trying to put on different things. I remember when I was prepping for my TED talk, the young lady that was assisting someone that was in the show, she said, it takes so long and I feel so bad when I'm putting on this jacket. I, I just don't want to tug or pull too hard. I said, well, have you ever tried this jacket by Coolway Sports? And she said, or Coolway Sport. And she said, no, their technology was that you can unzip everything from the cuff, from your wrist, all the way down. So then it's basically, you sit it over the person's head and voila, you zip. It just completely change the interaction with her and her client that she was acting as a caregiver for. And it cut time. There are people that take sometimes 15, 20, 30 minutes. If someone wakes up and they have pain, it could take them an hour to get dressed if they have to constantly stop and then start again because of that pain. So this is my litmus test. Is it accessible? easy to put on and take off? Is it medically safe? Is it smart for your health? Finally, and most importantly to me, or just as importantly, not less important, but just as important, is it fashionable? Do you love it? Does it work for your body type? And does it work for your lifestyle? Accessible, smart, fashionable. Share it, use it, cite me because I think it's important for people to know. I think it's important for people to know that, you know what? I don't have to do a hundred hacks, but I can have a disciplined way of approaching how I determine if my clothing actually act as assistive technology or if it prohibits me from being as independent as possible. Because here's the thing, if your clothing is accessible, smart and fashionable, you will be able to dress with as much dignity and independence as possible. And it'll make it fun again. It does not have to be this thing that you dread to do or this thing that you feel like, ugh, I can't get it done in time or ugh, I, I always have to ask someone. I've had conversations with wives that, you know, talk to their husbands and they're like, you know, they've maybe someone in the family has hired me to work with them and they, they communicate to me how, you know, I love my husband, but I don't want him to be my caregiver. I don't want him to have to help me pull on 
you know, certain clothes or to do this. I want to come out and have the reveal. You know, I want him to see me as, you know, his partner, you know, someone that he's excited about being with. And I'm using those pronouns because those refer to the people that uh, this, that was the, the pro, those were the pronouns of the people that were actually part of that anecdote. So I understand that. And that's where that comes from. Because I feel like until the fashion industry decides that dressing him and him is not easier or more important than dressing people with disabilities, the disability fashion styling system and my styling method that you're gonna learn a bit more about is a great way to bridge that gap. And I remember when someone they said, ah, oh, that's hyperbole. Dogs don't have more clothing designed for their bodies than people with disabilities. People with disabilities have on clothes. I said designed for their specific body types. And pre-COVID, I was saying sold in stores. I can go to drug stores. I can go to big box stores. I can purchase it online. Small dog, big dog, booties, coats all kinds of apparel for pets. And I remember when I first started saying this, it was in 2006. And the, the, the thing that I didn't tell you about my disability fashion styling system is I actually developed it after reaching out to brands in 2003. And I had brands, several brands really kind of string me along for a year, bring me out to their factories, pat me on the head and never take my call again. And after being involved in this space since 1992 and talking to anyone that I could talk to, helping as many people as I could, not as a business, not as a desire to write some type of dissertation, but literally just trying to help solve a problem because I just thought I couldn't believe that this is this way. And, you know, after they, you know, flew me out and told me I was going to design for disability and talk to me and then just, it was a game for them. I wasn't mad at them. I felt like that gave me an opportunity to create something. And that's when I created the disability fashion styling system. But I started talking and asking the question, why are there more clothing options for pets than there are for people with disabilities when I went to the store to buy food and toys for my pet? And I'm thinking, I'm a pet parent. But what if I were a parent of a child who happened to have a seated body type and use a wheelchair for mobility? What if I came into the store and then had to purchase something? Right? So that's when I started saying, we've got to really look at this, this idea of desirable fashion customers. So now let's talk a little bit about body types. And this will give you a bit of insight into my styling method. So when I look at body types, I go beyond just the type of assistive technology. I don't, let me check the time real quick. Okay, we're still doing great. I go beyond just, you know, the different types of assistive technology. I make sure that I also include how that person might get dressed. So let's start with Tamara. This is a look that I put together for one of her events and Tamara, has a spinal cord injury, but she's paraplegic. So she has some movement in her upper body, but she is not able to stand on her own. But Tamara is able to actually get dressed in her chair. She doesn't have to lay down on the bed to transfer to get dressed. That's not something that she necessarily has to do. So that's how I look at her seated body type. One of the things that I've noticed is that a lot of the comments that I read on social media sometimes, they'll say, oh, this person was standing up. They're faking. They're, they don't really have a disability. They don't need that wheelchair. They're just using it for sympathy. No, people can be what's known as ambulatory wheelchair users. And there can be people that are ambulatory crutch users who also use wheelchairs when needed for maybe longer distances, days when they're feeling weak. They don't need to tell us why they're using their wheelchairs. It's just a thing that they may have to do. So also, let's take a look at this lovely little model's shoes. She's wearing her cute pink pants. This was for a Kohl's shoot. It was when they were introducing 
different looks and pieces for children with disabilities and just children that needed clothing that you know may have been softer and clothing that did not have tags and, and different things like that. So what you see around her legs, the black rim around her legs is what's known, they're known as AFOs. So these braces can make selecting shoes really difficult. And that's because most shoes for women in general, disability or not, are just not wide. So, and if they're not wide, and you cannot remove the sole, just take that sole. If the sole isn't removable, it's gonna make it difficult to find shoes for your children or for adults that wear AFOs. Also, this look, let's go down from here. I just wanna to go to the male model here. Uh, this is another look. This was for a Zappos adaptive shoe. And when I pulled this, he had never, tied his shoes. So Billy's footwear offers a shoe that literally the whole top of the shoe unzips and you can actually step into your shoe. So this was, he was saying to his mom, this was the first shoe that he was actually able to work with on his own. And that is how I view dressing people with disabilities. I look at body types. I look at, you know, what are their challenges? Dexterity challenges. Are there challenges with skin sensitivity? Do they prefer not to have certain emblems or do necklaces bother them? Like I pay attention and I make notes on all of those things. And here is another example from, I'm going to my left now. This, this lovely hoodie here was from the Coles collection. And I really liked it. It was very soft. Anyone could wear it, obviously, but it was really great because for, if you're someone with skin sensitivity and you need extra soft clothing just to feel comfortable, it was perfect. And I think that that is what human-centered design is for me. You, you design something with disability in mind from the beginning, and it just works for so many people. No tags, just, accessible for a variety of people, universal design across spectrums. A lot of people don't know that when it comes to dwarfism, I'm looking at the picture in the top right, when it comes to my top right, when it comes to dwarfism, there is this idea that there, it's, it's not a spectrum, but it is. There are over 200 different types of dwarfism according to Little People of America. And when I worked with Zappos on this particular shoot, we wanted to make sure that we found clothing that worked with his body type, but mostly it's the footwear. So one of the things that people may not consider or think about size runs for little people, since the shirts and the denim worked, we usually have problems with the size run in the shoes. Because with the footwear, if you wear toddler size shoes, I'll introduce you to another model a little later, and she wears toddler size shoes, 9, 10. She's a grown woman, just turned 25. She doesn't want to wear unicorns on her shoes. She does not want to wear rainbows on her shoes. She wants heels. She wants clothing that's designed for her adult body. They didn't have it. She's now started designing for herself. So and selling it. So I just, I love how disability, innovation, they go hand in hand. This is another piece from Kohl's, that same software, no tags. And what I love about it is I love the print on this because a lot of times when people design for disability, there's this thing where the colors are kind of off. They're almost on trend. They're almost those Pantone colors, but not really which is another way of othering people with disabilities. Margot here, a model I worked with for Zappos, she actually has a seated body type, obviously, but she differs from Tamata, who I introduced you to a bit earlier, paraplegic. Margot is a quadriplegic. 
meaning that she has to have assistance dressing. Her mom is her dresser. And I know whenever we work together, they bring their table and she has to assist Margot in every aspect of getting dressed because she has paralysis from the neck down. And this is why I am so adamant about the idea of people with disabilities not liking fashion. It's just not true. You know, people want to wear clothes they love and they feel good in. You know, I know for myself during the pandemic, you know, getting dressed even on days like this, it's amazing because it's something that makes me feel good. Everyone is not going to respond the same way to clothing, to fashion, but I feel like, shouldn't we have the choice? to do so if we want to? I would say yes. All right, so another look from Kohl's, wider openings at the shoulders to make sure that you're not struggling if you have paralysis to get that t-shirt on and off. I love the print. Once again, it may not seem like anything to anyone else, but normally when there is this desire to include disability in the design process, it's like all other design elements go out the window. It becomes this functional garment as opposed to an actual fashion piece with functional elements. Here's, this is really important to me because seated body types, as I said, there's a misunderstanding. So this is Jordy. He does not actually have, he does not have spina bifida. He does not live with quadriplegic, he's not quadriplegic or paraplegic. He has, I think Jordy is able to, he's an ambulatory wheelchair user, but he does not have any problems with moving. Like he can get up and he can ambulate in his way in short spaces and he just doesn't have any problem with it. And someone that may look at him may think, okay, maybe he's faking because he's able to get himself up. But even living with cerebral palsy, it doesn't prohibit him from being an ambulatory wheelchair user. Now, he's not like Brandy here, pink sweater, who is an ambulatory wheelchair user, but uses a wheelchair. I would say she splits the time depending upon how her chronic illness impacts her body. But if you saw her standing up, you would think, oh, she doesn't need a wheelchair. And why is that important with dressing with disabilities? Because if you're trying to be a dresser or a stylist or a designer or helping someone, understanding your end user, understanding the person, the human being that you're working with will inform this type of interaction. You won't, you won't make the mistake of not knowing what to say, how to say it. A lot of times people say, I don't really know what to say to that person. How, how do I refer to them? Do I talk to them this way or do I talk to them that way? I say, you usually start with the name. And then if it's important for you to understand more about their disability based on the type of work you're doing, then that's appropriate. If not, a lot of people find it offensive for you to walk up to them and say, what happened to you? You know, because like me, I used to believe the lie of ableism very rarely use it, but I think in this case, it's appropriate that there was something that I needed to overcome. I don't need to overcome anything. It's just who I am and how I am. And so I think it's important to see the human, education through interaction, maybe listen more than you talk, go through your learning curve, get it wrong, apologize, get it right, keep it moving. Let's normalize the fact that bodies with disabilities are not spectacles. I like to also, I wanna highlight the, another body type and I didn't do it previously. So I would like to go back to it just really quickly here. Now she is also an amputee, but she does not wear a prosthetic. This is a prosthetic. As a stylist, this matters for me because this impacts the garment. Assistive technology, tough on clothing, especially clothing that is inexpensive 
and poorly construct it, it'll rip it apart. It's, it's just better to spend a bit more anyway. It's more sustainable if you get, you know, fabric with really quality fabrics. And I try to make sure they're double seams, just those type of details I pay attention to, because if I put my client in something that they're going to, that's going to be ruined, you know, within two weeks, it's not helpful. I'm not doing my job well. And so Shahali wears this uh, prosthetic. There are times that she doesn't when she's modeling, but it's helpful for her and her work and in her life. She loves it. And so she wears a prosthetic, which impacts the type of blouses and shirts and dresses and everything that she'd be able to wear. Tatiana also has a seated body type. Tatiana lives with spina bifida. She is an ambulatory wheelchair user, meaning when, for instance, we go to the store, she's able to lift herself out of the chair, but she's not able to walk. She can drag her feet, but she's not able to actually stand straight up. But she is able to handle her wheelchair. She, you know, propels herself independently. Uh, but that's important to know. Now, with regards to how, like I talked about Margot's body type and how Margot, when she gets dressed, she's basically laying on a table and is completely dressed. Tatiana needs to have a bench to transfer. So as an actor in LA, oftentimes they'll call her to set and they won't have a bench for her to transfer on, meaning to lift herself out of her chair and kind of lean back and lay on the bench to dress and undress herself. And that's important for her because that's what she needs in order to do that. Drew also lives with dwarfism and Drew is a smaller, uh, the type of dwarfism she has, she's three inches, three, uh, three, four, I believe. And so her shoe size is the toddler shoe size. And currently she's wearing heels in this shot. There was a store called the Little Shoe Store and she was able to find shoes that were toddler size, but for adults. That's so rare, but I would like for it not to be. Another young lady, Carnesha, lives with spina bifida, but she wears toddler size shoes as well, size maybe between a 10 and a 12, so a little larger than Drew, but still toddler size. So like I said, if you hear nothing else with regards to uh, maybe someone that's short statured or someone that is a little person, size run. Make sure that the toe box, it's wider, and because it also has to accommodate and taller, higher, not taller, higher and wider would be great because there is a little extra uh, fatty tissue on the top of the foot and it makes it difficult for someone that's living with dwarfism to, to wear shoes that are made for children as an adult little person. Still doing great on time. I hope that this is helpful and that you're able to understand what I do as a stylist for people with disabilities in determining body types. And the crux of my styling method is going to be the general art and science of styling, which is what stylists use all over the world and have done for decades now. But then the specialty portion of it is the way that I process and think about my clients. And I always think about how they're going to be able to get dressed. Is it going to be with as much independence and dignity as possible? And that's, I always, it's kind of like, if you were to think about it like a production, that's my pre-production before we get into the main event, which is, you know, actually doing the styling and putting looks together. And then the post-production, you know, is this going to be something that's going to last for a long time? If, are they going to love it? Are they going to, is it going to hold up to their assistive technology that they're using? So this is, this is the way that I process information in my mind. And I think a lot about how do they change clothes? Do they sit up? Do they lay down? Do they lean back? Do they need to transfer onto the floor? Do they need to be laid down on a couch? Do they need a, a sturdier, you know, table? These are things that you think about. And you know what? 
once stores start to do this post COVID, once we're able to start to think in terms of how to not make the people change with disabilities, but to change the structural barriers, this will be the same as putting captions on our videos now. I think, you know, there was a lot of moaning and now people are like, oh, I like the captions because I can, I can watch it and read it at the same time. I mentioned it a little bit earlier or texting, things that weren't made for the general population but have benefited the general population. If you're some with, someone with arthritis and you can't turn a handle, the lever works. It works for wheelchair users. It works for women that are you know, pushing strollers. If you're someone that gets in a car and just turning because of your arthritis or your dexterity challenges, you're not able to turn the, you know, the key in the car, those push buttons, I remember when they came out and I was thinking, wow, so yeah, disability, innovation. I wanted to show you something. A lot of times when someone who was not born with a disability gets into some type of accident or something happens where they go from having a standing body type ambulating standing to someone ambulating seated, here's something that I wanna show you an example. So this is one of my clients, Lauren. This was at the NAACP awards last year. And there was this garment, it's elastic waist, you know, thick band, lays flat, but it looked horrible on her when she was seated. This is the way that it looked on the bottom. And so I went to my tailor and I said, this is for the NAACP awards we can you know, have a little bit more fun, be a little bit more flamboyant. Having the, you know, the, the kind of focal point be the feathers on the skirt. I don't think the picture does it justice the way that it looked in person, but it was really breathtaking because one of the things that women who ambulate walking, there can be motion in the dress. There can be motion in you know, a cape or something that flows on them. But when you're seated, finding motion in what you wear without it getting caught in your wheelchair can be very difficult. So I wanted to give her a little bit of motion. I wanted it to be a little bit flamboyant because this was the NAACP awards. I wanted her to stand out and have fun. Uh, she had just been nominated for an independent spirit award. We had done the uh, spirit awards and this was the next week. And I just thought this would just be so much fun. And she had a blast. And one of the things that I was able to do is, this is how I transformed it from someone, a client that stands to someone that sits and giving her some movement. So, you know, I, I was getting all of these, these great images of her, you know, shaking the feathers and having that movement. Lastly, as we wrap, Fashion's disability problem. I think the best way to say this without being negative or, or seeming like, you know, that this is something that they created, I just want to address the, the fact that if you don't see people with disabilities as viable fashion customers, you will not design for people with disabilities. And a lot of times what I'm starting to see is I like seeing people on runways, but I like to see people on runways the way that Tommy by Zendaya did it. One of my clients, Lolo, who also models for Tommy, he'll figure Tommy adapted. She was in the audience with other models with and without disabilities. They all had on the collection that was on the runway. There was no press release about it and it should not have been. And when you went to the website that night, because that's what I pay attention to, how are they telling the story? How are they merchandising it? I went to the website and the banner at the top, of course, Zendaya, Tommy, they had Curvy, 
adaptive. And of course, Zendaya had on the, the collection that was also on the runway. And I had not seen that before. And they didn't do this, like I said, they didn't have this big press release saying, we're gonna be inclusive even on our site. Now, when you go to the site, when you click on women, you can click on women, curvy, adaptive, it's all in one place. That's the future. That's the human center, universal, adaptive all together. That's the place I think we need to go. But until fashion feels, stops feeling as if they're doing disability a favor, when in fact, disability will cause the industry to be more innovative. You know how great it is for the environment to have fewer fasteners with all the fashion waste? It's not just good for people with disabilities. And what I've been saying to people is, if you can't get beyond people with disabilities right now, I would not get into it. If I have a client that comes to me and they're interested in getting into this space and they can't deal with disability and they just kind of want to jump right into it because it's going to be a money maker and they want to get in on the, the ground floor, I'm not the person to work with them. Because here's what I understand. They're going to get so many things wrong because they're not even seeing the human at the center of the design. Yes, there's money to be made, but there's also a cultural learning curve that you have to go through. And then, you know, we have to look at what you currently have. We need to know where do you enter into the space? You know, there's so many ways in which to approach it. But when I see someone that's like that, they don't have buy-in from the top, I already know it's just going to be a headache. And it's not someone that's serious. And so at 28 years, about to be 29 years in this space in 2021, I'm done with that. I want to work with people that understand the value of designing with disability in mind from the beginning, as opposed to, oh yeah, let's get that disability dollar. Because the problem is, is that there's going to be a problem because you're not seeing the human attached to it. It's akin to what happens with the curvy market. It's akin to what happens with gender neutral. It's akin to what happens with designing and relating to and including black people, people of color. There has to be a thoughtful approach when it comes to design for disability. Design for disability is important for me as a person with a disability serving others with disabilities, helping them dress. That's important for me because I view really well-made, human-centered, universally designed and adaptive design as assistive technology. As a matter of fact, I think it should be legislated that that should be something that's covered. Veterans get a clothing allowance. Veterans that are disabled get a clothing allowance. It's modest, but it literally says it can shred if your assistive technology is shredding your clothing, they get a very modest allowance for that. I think that should be the norm. So in closing, I hope this serves as a clean palette to you, like to kind of say, okay, if I've been thinking about this wrong, now I have an idea of how to approach it. I would reconsider this word. How does it make you feel? What do you think about when you see it? And I would be honest with, with myself if I were you. I would just say, okay, I don't care what she says. I hate the word. I'm still gonna use differently abled or all abilities. Take your journey. You don't ever have to like it, but just deal with it because that is at the crux of why I can show you a book, although be it kind of like a, a catalog type book from 1961 and we're headed to 2021. And at both times and throughout history, there has been no substantive marketplace for people with disabilities. It's because we have not dealt with DISA B. 
B-I-L-I-T-Y. You know a little bit about dressing with disabilities now. Some of the common myths. You've heard of functional fashion. You've seen a bit of insight into my styling system, how I work to bridge the gap and eradicate negative perceptions of disability. And finally, you've heard me talk about the need to have substantive, authentic conversations about the problems with disability in the fashion industry. I hope it's been helpful. I thoroughly enjoyed sharing it with you. And again, thank you. I was honored to be a part of your speaker series. Thank you so much.